On that happy note, let me just ask you one more thing about something also unhappy before I turn it over. And there's so much more to be said. Um, but since I'm in this kind of sad mood lately, uh, we're living, right, in an era of unprecedented language loss, species loss, eco devastation, political, economic upheaval, um, displacement of millions of people, creation of climate refugees. And so it's an irony that this is a moment in which the US, that was a global leader in the 20th century, has now very specifically declined to lead on the issue of climate change, which is arguably one of the biggest threats the world has faced. By that same token, it seems that there is an opportunity for a rising Asia to really lead on this issue. Um, and maybe there's no hope for the world if it does not. So, since we just heard about those wonderful quality of deliberative uh, democracy and so forth, maybe the question is unfair. But can we expect, or should we expect India to lead the world on the issue of climate change, maybe in the adoption of renewable energy and so forth? And is it fair to place that kind of world historical burden on India's shoulders? No, it's, it's not fair, and that's precisely the challenge we're facing. You see, the developing countries are still facing a reality that the rest of you in the developed world have long since bypassed. That is that there are at least 600 million people, of whom about 400 million would be in India alone, who around the world cannot take for granted what all of you would assume as a basic human right to flick a switch on a wall and have your room bathed with light. Right? And then electricity connections don't exist in so many households. That's how basic the challenge of development is. Now, you, no one has yet found a way of generating electricity for mass consumption without producing greenhouse gas emissions. So the fact is that you are looking at a situation in which, unless and until there is some new technological revolution uh, in, in bringing mass electricity out of hydrogen or um, solar cells become terribly affordable or whatever else it is, we are still looking at a situation where many poor countries, including India, are going to say, I'm sorry, we still have to reach a basic level of offering decent living standards to our people. And so you cannot expect us to make the sacrifices that it's reasonable to demand of you to make. Whereas the Western world says, you know, we're used to a lifestyle in which uh, the per capita emissions we generate are 25 times what you generate, and yet we want you to tighten your belt. So that's the unfairness of the entire debate. The Industrial Revolution really took place from about the early 19th century, early to middle 19th century, and the countries that profited from it de facto also contributed over 90% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions that have led to climate change uh, in, our, in our time. So what the developing countries have argued is, yes, we have a common responsibility for climate change, but it's got to be a common but differentiated responsibility because there are different costs and burdens involved. Uh, and we've also argued, for example, that the richer countries could, for example, uh, give us uh, access to low-cost green technologies so we can develop without doing the same amount of damage to the environment that they did when they developed. Uh, they've been quite reluctant to do that. And their argument is, again, based on their systems. They say that most of our technologies are in the private sector, and the private sector exists on the basis of fair reward for innovation. Therefore, we cannot expect them to transfer their technologies to you for less than they can make a decent profit on. And that's, again, a uh, sort of a conundrum one can't easily resolve. But we are looking, therefore, at a situation in which the burdens are inequitable and they're difficult to sustain. It's been sad to watch how China has caught up with the US and is now the leading polluter in the world. Uh, when it was a poor country with people living on the absolute edge of poverty, uh, it was a, a good guy on the climate change thing. Now it's actually become a very major polluter. Uh, India still isn't. India, uh, at 17% of the world's population, uh, contributes less than 4% of, of global uh, uh, emissions. And China, with 17.5% of the world's population, is up at 22%. 
And of course, the US and the developed world with about 5% of the world's population is contributing 27, 28, 29%. So if you look at all of that, um, to work out a fair solution um, that is acceptable to all sides becomes as challenging as it's proved to be. As you know, Donald Trump and company have rejected even the principles agreed in the Paris Climate Change Accord, which was the mildest version of acknowledgement on all sides of this principle. So I'm sorry I can't give you an easily reassuring answer. We can help lead thinking and talking about this. In our own countries, I think it's very clear that a country like India will never reach, never is a long word, but never reach the level of per capita emissions the US has reached. We can even make a real effort to ensure we don't reach even the level where China has reached, because uh, we can take advantage of later technologies, and we can also do some things uh, more efficiently because of the fact that we are reaching the stage later than other countries. Um, but there are some things we can't afford to do. For example, I've forgotten the exact percentage, but something like 85% of our energy comes out of extremely inefficient thermal power plants run on coal, which is a major pollutant. But the costs of converting those plants to something that is less polluting would be prohibitive for any government to contemplate. And so governments have been putting off a decision to come up with it. Their answer, which I'm afraid is an answer only on paper, even from the present government, is to improve their solar uh, capacity. And our present government announced in Paris a totally unrealistic target of how much percentage of our energy needs are going to be made from solar. Uh, they haven't even come to one two hundredth of what they expected to. But frankly, when they said it, I challenged them in Parliament saying, how are you going to get there? It's not possible. Uh, and this is part of the reality. You know, governance is not about waving a wand or fulfilling some ideals. It's about making tough choices involving real people whose real needs you can see before you every time you're going to get their votes. And at the same time, working within the realities of the actual budget you have and the constraints of the money you can raise. So I, I, I would be naive or dishonest in implying we could do a lot more and much more than we are already doing. And what we're doing is clearly not enough to tackle this vast human, human damage that uh, climate change is bringing about to all of us. No, it's a, well, it's an impossible situation. I think as Amitabh Ghosh wrote in The Great Derangement, his climate change book, if everybody in the world had um, a refrigerator and a washing machine and two cars, we'd asphyxiate. We, we just fix it. Yeah, it's, it's just not tenable. Um, so much more to talk about. I want to give you all a chance, looking now shielding from the light, to ask questions. So I think I'm going to return my mic to the floor. My name is Dinesh Pajaj. I live here in the Bay Area. I have lived for the last 50 years. Wow. I'm from Delhi, IIT Delhi. Take credit for that. Uh, reparations, you talked about that one. Why not, instead of pound, uh, one pound a year that you were referring to, I would like to see our Kohin Kohinoor come back. <laughs> is that possible? That should, that's a suggestion. But the real question is, I've seen movies about Churchill, how great he was and all that, and I've seen your clips. Can't we make some movies to show the other side and really blast it to the Brits that they really did a lot of damage to our country? That, and you could write yes. that script for that movie. <laughs> you know, um, the people have been trying to talk me into writing a Churchill book. Uh, I've been hesitant simply because I don't have the time for any original research and my prejudices are far too deeply entrenched to be changed by much research. But I mean, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that, that he was an absolutely evil monster. And one of the, you know, that 20th century <laughs> horrors of, of, you know, Mao, Stalin, uh, Churchill belongs in that company, just perhaps slightly better than Pol Pot, but not much, uh, not much better than the others. I mean, that's Sadly, the reality, uh, from the point of view of an Indian or an African or many of the others who were victims of his racism, his prejudice, uh, and his arrogance, but uh, the West has not been able to look beyond the bombastic speeches of the Second World War. Uh, having said that, um, uh, on the first point about the Kohinoor, uh, I have been, and as many know, an advocate of getting the Kohinoor back. Uh, I'm shocked. I was shocked, but now I'm no longer shocked or surprised by anything with the Modi government. When the Modi government uh, sent its Solicitor General to argue in court that the Kohinoor was a gift to the British and therefore would stay there. When you ask an eight-year-old boy to hand over his family's most precious heirloom, and he's already a prisoner in your custody, separated by his, from his mother, and is told what to do, what do you expect he's going to do? I said, you know, if you point a, head at my, a, bullet, a gun at my head and ask my wallet, 
I'll give it to you, but that doesn't mean that when you put your gun away, I wouldn't want my wallet back. And, and so I think it's entirely reasonable for us to ask for that stone back. But the, uh, the, the, the Modi government, unfortunately, has, has taken a rather retrograde view. Um, there's also a, a rather unfortunate act of the Indian parliament, which, of course, the Modi government had the majority to overturn. But there's an act of the Indian parliament that says that all the provisions for return of antiquities will only apply to those antiquities that were stolen after 1972, which seems a bit silly because a vast majority of our losses were well before 72 and indeed well before 47. So we should, I agree with you, get it back. There are now movements springing up. Uh, and, and, and there are a couple of groups. There's a chap called Anurag Saxena, who's based in Singapore, I think, who's, who's got a thing going on, on reparations and uh, particularly return of stolen artifacts. The Jews have succeeded in getting a lot of artifacts back from Second World War loot. And people are saying, if we can do it for one group, why not for the others? The French announced, President Macron announced last month, that they were going to return some very precious objects to Benin in West Africa, which were products of the West African civilization uh, of the period of French colonialism. So I've uh, been preceding French colonialism. So if it's, it's beginning to happen, the British may no longer be able to remain impervious. But when David Cameron was asked about the Kohinoor as prime minister on a visit to India, he said, I'm afraid it's going to have to stay put because if we give that to you, the British Museum would soon be empty, which of course is true. Thank you. So my name is Shubha. I'm a stay-at-home mom now. I was a software engineer for 17 years, and I said, enough of sitting in the cubicle. And now I do volunteer at the South Asian Heart Center for two days, giving back to the community. Try and speak into the mic, because we're losing your every second word. Okay. So my question is, why, why do you say that Congress government tried to implement the GST for 10 years, but they were not successful. And BJP implemented it, but then they implemented it wrong. So should I consider this as Congress government tried to implement it for 10 years, but they were not successful because BJP government opposed it? And is it the failure of the Congress government? Or is it the success of the BJP government because it implemented so quickly? No, because the GST could not have been implemented without the cooperation of the opposition, particularly the state governments. And the opposition to the GST was led by the Chief Minister of Gujarat at the time, Mr. Modi, and by the BJP party in parliament as well. So, so the GST was never adopted. It had to be a law first before you can implement it. Whereas when Mr. Modi brought the GST, after battling hard for some improvements to bring it closer to our idea, we finally surrendered in the national interest and we helped pass the law that made. So if you have a constructive opposition, you can get laws passed and then you can implement it. But the way they implemented it is what I'm criticizing. Had the BJP agreed to the GST that we brought in, our concept was much simpler. We had a draft bill that they did not allow discussion in parliament. The bill was it will cover everything, whereas the present BJP uh, version excludes a number of items, petrol, tobacco, alcohol, communications, all ex electricity, are all excluded from GST. We would have included everything, and we would have had one flat rate, which we had pegged initially at 13%, whereas they have had these five rates plus two supplementary rates. So they have chosen to implement it uh, in a way that's, that's ineffective. That's, that was my point. But the Congress party never had a chance to implement it at all because there was no adoption of a law because the law was resisted by the BJP. The GST law is actually a constitutional amendment and needs two thirds of parliament. We couldn't have passed it without the BJP. So in effect, so is BJP more successful now because it implemented and convinced the uh, opposition to do it? I'm sorry, I missed that. There's a long line behind you, okay, but just, so just quickly. This. Okay, so I just have just one more very quick question. Okay, we leave that GST. Uh, welcome to the Bay Area. Mr. Thank you. I'm a big fan and admirer of you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I like to I like to understand from you what are some of the qualities of Rahul you think that kind of qualify him to become a prime minister? It's a I mean, obviously, the most important quality is to be the leader of the 
largest opposition party in India with the faith and support of the party members and workers, but I'm assuming you're referring to personal qualities. So the personal qualities that Rahul would bring to the, to the job, but first of all, he is um, intellectually curious and knowledgeable in a way that vastly exceeds the capacity of the incumbent. Mr. Modi is not a man who reads very much. Rahul Gandhi is an avid reader who digests and absorbs what he reads and who can grapple with ideas at a level of sophistication that you would want in the chief executive of a large and complex government. Secondly, he's a listener which I'm told by BJP people, the present prime minister is not. Thirdly, he's somebody who believes very much in collaborative leadership. We have been seeing for five years the, the man on a white horse model of leadership, the guy cantering in on a stallion with upraised sword saying, I know all the answers, I'll solve all the problems. And we've seen how badly that's worked out for five years. Whereas here you've got a guy who's coming on foot and saying, I don't know all the answers, but you know what? I listen to you as to what the questions are and I will come accompanied by a deep and experienced and qualified bent strength of able people who will work with me and you to solve the problems that you have. And that different leadership style is something that's invaluable in a complex democracy, where you really need results by all of us having a stake in those results, rather than one person saying, I can do everything, I can solve everything, because they can't. And a country like ours, it's already been proven over the last five years that that style of leadership produces very bad results. Whereas this style of leadership, by bringing people along with them, can actually be transformative in a very healthy way. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, I wish you all the best for your Lok Sabha election. Thanks. Uh, 23rd of May is the counting. Yep, it is. Uh, my name is Trivikram Krishnamurthy. Uh, I have not been in the Bay Area for 50 years, uh, although I went to IIT Madras. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not fully getting your words. Okay. I have not been in the Bay Area for 50 years. Right. Um, my question to you is about the demographics of India. Now, India's median age is 27. America's is 37. Um, and yet, when you look at the political class, can you hear me better now? For some reason, it's not come, it's coming very muffled. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah, much better. Okay. Um, so my question was about the demographics of India, and uh, I'll contrast that a little bit with America's. India's median age is 27, America's is 38. And yet when you look at the political class, there have been three presidents, three American presidents who were elected president when they were in their 50s. And you have to go back all the way back to VP Singh to find a prime minister who was elected in, in their 50s. Now, if you look at somebody like Barack Obama, who's uh, prima facie a bright guy, like you are, you are prima facie a bright guy. Uh, but <laughs> if, if, you look at, if, you look at, if you look at Barack Obama, um, he shot to prominence in 2004, and it took him all of four years to become president. You, if I may say so, have been, for lack of a better word, languishing as an MP for the last 10 years, and you know spring chicken. Now, now why is A different it, system. <laughs> well, uh, I, if I may, could you please give me a deeper answer than that? Um, it seems like the geriatric class has a stranglehold on politics in India. Why is that? <laughs> I honestly don't think it's geriatric. First of all, to answer the first part of the question, it's the parliamentary system doesn't make an Obama possible because in a parliamentary system, no individual can outshine the party structure. The party fights an election and the leader of the party becomes the claimant to the office of prime minister. If it's a coalition government, then the leaders of the various parties together will choose one amongst themselves. But ultimately, that's the way the system works. And since I'm not a party leader, I'm not in the fray, and it's, it's an academic question, and I accept that. I mean, you, you're playing a game, you play by the rules of the game. I've come back to India uh, to serve in a parliamentary system, so I know that that's not an option for me, and that's fine because I do believe one can make a difference wherever one serves and however one serves. Having said that, uh, the question of geriatrics is a good one because uh, what, what happens in a parliamentary system very often, it's those who've served the longest who have the, the, the stranglehold on the positions at the top. They're not necessarily the oldest people. I'm actually much older 
uh, than many of the people who are ahead of me, as it were, uh, are up the ladder in the Congress party, because they started much earlier. They came into politics in their 20s. And there are young people, uh, some of my close friends and colleagues amongst the younger generation, like Milindera, Sachin Pilot, Jyotiraditya Sindhya, all of these guys, were elected in their 20s and 30s the first time. And the seniority they have in the party will outstrip me in my 60s, because they've been around that much longer. So it's, it is age, it is length of service related rather than age related. So I can't pull my age on them, because geriatrics will eventually help me. But I can't because they have served longer, so they're the ones who actually uh, would be considered as having been there. Because I spent, you know, I lost 29 years of public life in India by my service in the UN. So uh, I have to accept that too as part of the rules of the game. Now, there are always exceptions. I mean, Dr. Manmohan Singh is, is, a, is a, uh, somebody who really came out of a very different background and found that opportunity. But the system, by and large, if you're looking at the classic political leaders have risen to the top, rewards parties rather than individuals, and rewards individuals within party structures who have um, a party backing for a particular position. Uh, so yeah, we won't have an Obama. And, and uh, that's simply the way things are in India. And, and it, it would require a change of system, which I've been advocating, not for myself, but in the interests of a more efficient governance of India. But it's not gonna happen because uh, to get a presidential system in India, you have to get the consent of the very politicians who know how to operate and manipulate the parliamentary system, and they're not about to give it up. They'd rather have the system they know than one whose theoretical benefits some America returned wonk is pointing out to them. So, there we are. Hello, I'm Kirtana. I graduated from IIT Kharagpur. Mm. I was a petitioner to the 377 legislation in India, and right now I do machine learning to put self-driving cars on the road. I'm also a Malayali, and my sisters live in Tiruvannathapuram. So Great. my question to you is, as your most recent term as MP comes to a close, um, what do you think are your three uh, most significant achievements? And secondly, as a politician, how do you differentiate between um, how to do the right thing and what majority of the electorate lives in? That's a very tough one, actually, because um, you have to strike a balance between being an effective representative uh, of your electorate and being a thought leader at the national level. So on 377, I took a gamble because uh, I think objectively there is no doubt that my electorate was not in sympathy with me on that. But it was happening at a time that was still, the elections were still some years away. I could afford to take a risk. And I also felt it was morally the right thing to do. Uh, plus, it wasn't a, a hot button issue that had inflamed people. There weren't protests in the streets of Tiruvananthapuram. It was a risk that was a calibrated risk that I could afford to take. And I did, as you know, stand up for the rights of Indian citizens to have the government out of their bedrooms. Uh, in the end, the courts were the forum where we won. So I can't list that as an achievement of mine because I was shouted down by the BJP MPs on the two occasions I tried to introduce that bill. But in the end, the right thing happened thanks to the judiciary. When you ask me what are the three biggest achievements, they won't be legislative achievements because in our system only the government of the day can pass legislation. So I've made some proud, I mean, I've made some important speeches in Parliament that I'm proud of that will stand the test of time on YouTube, whether it was on the Juvenile Justice Bill, for example, or challenging the budget of the government, or speaking up in terms of the Jallianwala Bagh issue. Or, they're, they're good speeches, but all, that's all they are. They haven't actually affected laws. But if I come down to what I've done for my constituency, I can pick three things very easily. Um, there was a National Highway Bypass project that had been stuck for 40 years after the stones had been laid in people's backyards. The funds had lapsed and the project had never been built. And people came to me with tears in their eyes saying that these stones meant they couldn't sell their land or do anything. Everyone would say, well, the government can take over your land any time, so why should we buy it? And they were uh, saying either get the whole project cancelled or get the road built. And I took that up as a challenge and with an enormous amount of effort, hundreds of meetings and phone calls, chasing after the ministers, chasing after the bureaucrats, got this included in the UPA budget, got the surveys done, which included chasing a dozen ministers to get the surveyors returned from other duties to conduct the survey in time, 
got this thing completed on time, got the, uh, the, the, the file signed, and got even, I even called the government press office to ensure that the full details of the project were printed in the government gazette before the 12-month deadline at the end of which the project would have lapsed. And having done all of that, I got the first funds transferred for the land to be purchased before the 2014 elections so that the BJP couldn't claim credit for my work, as indeed they tried to do after they won in 2014. Uh, but the, the money had already been spent, the land had been bought, and uh, the road has been constructed. It's about 90% done now, and that's uh, going to be a landmark achievement. In fact, uh, at 100 points along the way, I had to intervene personally uh, to deal with community objections to the road, get the bureaucrats in from the National Highway Authority, resolve problems, create overbridges and underpasses to resolve traditional right-of-way issues. And finally, we have a road that's going to transform the lives of generations yet to come. And I know that was because of my effort. So that's, that's something I'm very proud of. That's one example. She asked for three. I'll give two short ones. We don't have time for three. But there have been things like that, bringing in international companies into Trivandrum, et cetera, et cetera. No, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thiru. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be sharing space with you today as somebody so erudite and scholarly. Thank you. Uh, my question is, they say uh, India's broad stems from a bad legal, a poor legal system. Uh, would be very curious to know what your thoughts are on uh, uh, judicial reform or whatever, because you you have the ability to crystallize big things and present it in simple ways, like good communicators and leaders do. So, if you can briefly tell us what your thoughts are. On, uh, it would be nice. Thank oh, you. I, I agree with you that it's crying out for reform. Um, there is a backlog of cases that would shame any democracy in the world. Uh, so much so that there have actually been cases settled last year that were originally filed under the British Raj. Uh, that's, that's the kind of way. Uh, we have a, a system the British have settled us with that is excessively procedural, frequent adjournments. The judges seem to know absolutely no restraint on what kind of cases they'll admit. I was personally tied up for four years in a completely frivolous case, arguing that I'd insulted the country by placing my hand on the heart for the Indian national anthem. Because there are rules that say you have to stand stiffly to attention for the national anthem. And by putting my hand on my heart after 9-11, 26-11, that I had, can you imagine, four years I was tied up and every time the, the, the guys who had filed the complaint would fail to show, the judge would give them one more month and it went on and on. And I'd spend lakhs of rupees defending myself in a case that should never have been taken up. But you've got all of these things going on in India as well. And the result is that th th we have a colossal, colossal uh, sclerosis in the judicial system. On top of that, we have large numbers of unfilled vacancies. Um, the, the, the judicial system is, is in very many ways broken. And it's compounded by the fact that as you go up the chain, um, where the quality of justice is so much more important, Supreme Court judgments and so on, there have been more and more worrying signs of uh, encroachments by the government of the day uh, upon the autonomy and independence of the judiciary. Uh, last year in January, we had four judges uh, emerging outside the Supreme Court to express their concerns about the future of judicial independence in the country. And, and so these are all things that worry us greatly. We must both uh, restaff the judiciary, simplify procedures to get rid of the backlog of cases, and expand their numbers, as well as somehow insulate them from political pressure. It's going to take a lot of work, but it needs to be done. Thank you, sir. Shashi, I'm 72, nine years senior to you. <laughs> I am the only one in this well-to-do, happy, wealthy Indian audience who just emerged from your campaign trail. Thank you, Gandhiji. The young lady, IIT Kharagpur. IITs exist. Why? Indian National Congress. Is that true? Yes, I'm founded by Jawaharlal Nehru's vision Mahatma for Mahatma Gandhi uh, gave the, 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 uh, the, the torch to uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. We were poor, but found the money with German, Russian, US help, right? Right. And you are the torch. You mentioned 
people on the outskirts down through rent shashi when you win i i will be there on the 22nd right when you win i will take you to kudumba sangam i am a liar and because i have a connection whatever it is they were nice mostly because of the the situation and they were ladies many of them in rental places many of them in rental places please ask a question oh okay. i don't have any any more no question agni you are you are you are yes no, i'm on strict you orders press. i'm on strict I, orders i don't have any more but just just a quick question i know person i just simply want to say i want to say shashi in a tight race you are going to make it and i want to make sure i have not any question or i say oh, what i have a question i want to agni i want to say one more thing. you are here i came to this country in 1970 to university in mississippi i was one of the two indians we are here because lbj Lyndon Baines Johnson, Wade Johnson, Lucy Fred Johnson, LBJ, and he didn't contest. He went back to LBJ Ranch and grew beautiful hair like you, but long, you know, over here. Anyway, the point I'm saying that he relaxed, he relaxed the immigration law, which Nixon did not oppose. That is why we're all here. Please, LBJ, when I uh, handsome LBJ and handsome Shashi uh, Ragini, no more questions. Thank you very much. I love you to death. That's it. Uh, <laughs> I'll lighten up the mood a little bit, right, Shashi? So I'm Bhavesh Shah, right, and have been in Bay Area for about 20 years. Uh, the question was on fake news, right? Uh, and a lot of it is happening in India where mobs are incited and such, right? So if Rahul Gandhi, Congress government comes to power, are you guys thinking about some sort of regulation or framework to kind of mend the social media because? Uh, I mean, a lot of people like you and us here with intellect are able to kind of discern the news, but there's a lot of people who are not able to, and that causes grave harm, right? And and then a couple of smaller ones is: Do you eat mangoes and do you eat them cut or with your hands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm an arm admi. I eat mangoes any which way I get them. <laughs> my name is Samir. I've been here in the Bay Area for 20 years. Uh, my question is you. I think I read recently that you had you are promoting uh, converting the uh, Victoria Memorial in Calcutta to a museum, right? <coughs> for British. Oh, it is a museum, but converting it to a museum for oh, British is. atrocities. Well, there is a Jewish Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C. My proposal is: Why don't we all, as Indian diaspora, uh, create a museum of British atrocity? Right in front of British Parliament, where Mahatma Gandhi statue is. <laughs> They won't give you permission. <laughs> well, you can buy land. I mean, it's a free country and it's a capitalistic country, so <laughs> it's an idea. Now there should be a museum in London. I agree with you, but probably not directly there. You won't get the land. But anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm all in favor of a museum on colonial atrocities. Hi, Mr. Tharoor. Uh, my name is Aditya. I'm um, an engineer here. originally from kerala from kasaragod the other end of the state huge admirer of yours um thank you as a liberal voter i think that the congress party is a natural home for people like me um i tend to i'm, I'm going to refer to it as our party because uh sure it is uh, the last home i mean the best hope that we have uh, to live in a liberal democracy having said that uh, uh whatever it is that you have to say about uh, the prime minister mr modi and a lot can be said about him his policies his style of governance etc as indeed you have in your book um his rise from a really poor background one of the poorest backgrounds imaginable to be the chief minister of the state to be the prime minister of our country inspires millions of people who want to see india to be a meritocracy on the other hand what do we have in our party in our party we have the son the grandson great grandson of a prime minister a man who has zero administrative experience he doesn't zero administrative experience a village of 10000 people let alone a state of 60 million people and i really worry and this man was elected unopposed the president of our party right his his mother 16 years before him won the election with 99% of the vote there are 
dictatorships in Central Asia where the dictators win with a lower vote percentage than Mrs. Gandhi did. What? Why is it that a man like you, a man of enormous capability, a man of extraordinary achievements, at best can hope to be a Minister of State for External Affairs in the Rahul Gandhi cabinet? Or if you uh, play your cards right, you can be the foreign minister, you know, ultimately the foreign minister. So do you recognize this as a problem? Mr. Modi recognizes nepotism in politics as a problem that affects his party. It affects our party rampantly. So do you recognize it as a problem? And are you willing in the future to uh, mount a challenge to replace this totally unworthy candidate who we have as the president of our party? Okay, well, uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll address both the issues. On, 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 on fake news, uh, there is a problem with fake news, and it's, you know, it's not just political problems of fake news. Fake news has killed people, right? There was this fake WhatsApp rumor about child molesters running loose in a particular area of Bengal, which resulted in innocent people being lynched by, by, by anxious villagers. And in one case, a government official who was sent to the area to tell them the rumors were false got lynched himself and was killed because people were that paranoid that these guys were on the prowl to kidnap their children. So fake news has killed people in India. It's not a small matter. Uh, but there are real issues in how do you regulate this. You don't want to restrict freedom of expression in any democracy. Uh, at the same time, uh, you want to find somebody to be held accountable. There's even a real question as to whether Facebook and, 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 and WhatsApp and, and Google and, and, and others are a publisher and therefore accountable like a publisher, or whether they're merely a delivery service like a post office and therefore they're not responsible for the contents they deliver. And there is a real argument. They're arguing we're like a postman. If, if somebody sends you hate mail, you don't hold the post office responsible. You find the person who sent you hate mail, go after them, don't come after us. Whereas the other argument is you guys are like a publisher of incendiary material where the publisher can be punished, you will be punished too if things on your platform are killing people. Uh, I used to be in the former camp. I've now moved more and more to the latter camp because I've seen the damage that fake news can do. And if indeed the private companies that are profiting in valuations and so on, from their own popularity and the large numbers of millions they have, if they feel accountable that they themselves are vulnerable, if lies are peddled through their platforms, maybe they will develop new algorithms or whatever to weed, weed, out, weed out fake news before it actually does damage and can hurt them too. So I am now more and more inclined to find a way of putting the onus on these platforms to identify and eliminate fake news as it comes. But I'm not pretending that it's easy. And of course, it immediately raises another question, which is, if they can read my, the WhatsApp messages I'm getting to delete the fake news, what else are they reading? Where is my privacy? I might have a right of privacy issue under the Supreme Court ruling. So I don't even know there's an easy way out at all. But we may have to find something like that. And we'll have to make sure it's a method that actually involves these big companies in finding a solution. Anyone has good ideas, give it to us. We have made no manifesto commitments, so we are not bound to any particular course of action. But this is certainly something we're going to have to give a lot of thought to. Now, on your question, let me just stress that as far as, uh, as, far as this question of uh, uh, leadership is concerned, there are very many factors that go in. Look, I already learned in the Secretary Generalship race that uh, a political decision is not always one based on pure objective merits. No political leader is elected on a resume, just as no secretary general is elected on a resume. Uh, and so you may have the best resume and still not be the person elected because life is unfair and politics is particularly unfair. Uh, you know, a, a more good looking candidate could get elected even if the less good looking person is more qualified and you'll say, well, that's democracy. So this is also democracy and that's something I should have the maturity and all of us should have the maturity to accept. But once you're elected, what happens? In the case of someone like Narendra Modi, he's not a beneficiary of nepotism. I have uh, expressed my own admiration for his rise from very humble origins. I think it actually is a great tribute to Indian democracy that somebody from such a humble past, which I've described in my book. The first chapter of Paradoxical Prime Minister is Narendra Modi's life story. And I've been uh, quite admiring of the hardships he underwent to get to where he got. 
But once he's come to power, he's running the country as a one-man army. And that, I'm afraid, is simply not good enough for a country like ours and with our large, diverse democracy. So if the guy who's come through nepotism, as you say, or through dynastic roots or through family advantages, actually turns out to be a better, more consultative, more accommodative, more effective leader, would you rather not have him than somebody who came up the hard way and has earned your admiration for that, but is actually running the country in a way that's dangerous for the country and its democracy? So these are the choices you have to make. And to my mind, the answer lies in, we have to accept realities. Politics, the famous cliche, is the art of the possible. So you know what is possible in your democracy. You, you live with that and work with that. Uh, you talked about challenging him within the party. I can guarantee you that in a free and fair election amongst Congress workers, any Congress leader you can care to name will lose in a free and fair election to Rahul Gandhi. The Congress workers want him. The day that changes, you may have a different leader. But right now, he would win fair and square within the party and the parliamentary system, that's all that matters. The party leader will be the one who will stake the claim at Rashtrapati Bhavan after the 23rd of May. Welcome back to the Bay Area, Dr. Tharoor. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great fireside chat. My question is about uh, more on the foreign policy uh, strategy of India. Uh, or developing countries like India against like a superpower uh, uh, or, or towards a superpower like US. So, so uh, it seems like US of course has affairs in a lot of parts of the world like Middle East or even the India, Pakistan, China power triangle. Um, do you think the Indian foreign policy or uh, strategy is or should be more aggressive because uh, it's, it's clearly a play on, uh, you know, power, uh, sort of a power play in world politics that superpowers tend to have it their own way. And, and again, coming back to, you know, your uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, chance that you had as a Secretary, Secretary General of the UN, uh, which was vetoed by the US. So, uh, so how do you take that pers as personally uh, in politics, like uh, these kind of attacks, and then about the foreign policy of India? Uh, hi, my name is Ravi. Uh, my question to you is regarding uh, the Sabrimala temple case um, last year and uh, the question is um, where do you stand between, I read your article where, where you mentioned that as a liberal you were a little tone uh, um, to stand between, I mean, uh, between gender equality and religious freedom as an, and as an extension, freedom of expression and um, uh, religious freedom. So where do you stand on that? Sorry, there are no laws here, and so I'm, I know I'm being a bit of a dictator, but can we have maybe one more woman, since we can only have one more question? All right, you can speak since, and then we'll take one woman. There have been a lot of, it's been a very male-dominated conversation. So we'll take one woman, and then I'm afraid we will have to break. Yeah, right? Dr. Sashi, good evening. My name is Raghavendran. I'm from a small town called Madurai in Tamil Nadu. I live here for the last 10 years, and I'm a history buff myself, and I'm a great admirer of your work on colonial Indian history. But sir, this is the election season. I hope after the elections, you would kindly reconsider the stance on Tipu Sultan, especially given what has happened in Northern Kerala. And I've been a history buff, read so much and spent so much time in Northern Kerala myself. And he himself is a paradox, like Mr. Modi. So I will be grateful if you can reconsider your stand on Tipu Sultan after the elections. Good evening, welcome, and we're looking forward to seeing you in soon. I'm Gauri, I'm a graduate from Wharton School of Business. Uh, growing up in India, I, was, I really admired Dr. Singh's presentation uh, and how he liberalized the economy. Um, but I was a little disappointed about how he had seemed to have his hands tied behind his back when he became the Prime Minister. So I was wondering, how do you think we can change policies where intellectuals like Dr. Singh, like yourself, can actually make, help implement policies which will help us make progress without having to defer to that party high command, whether it's the BJP or the Congress. Okay, maybe that young girl could have the last one then. Uh, you really we, have we to stop. You bit, really yeah. have to stop, I'm sorry. Hi, um, I'm a reporter with Bay City News in San Jose. Um, I have a question about Indians in the Bay Area. Uh, based on your idea of inclusive Hinduism, do you think that Indians in the Bay Area, especially those who are wealthy, have a responsibility to pay more attention to... A little closer, I'm not getting... Can you hear me now? 
Yeah, do you think Indians in the Bay Area, especially those who are wealthy, have a responsibility to pay attention to marginalized groups locally? You mean marginalized groups here or back in India? Here. Here? Yeah. Okay. So that's four really un unconnected questions. So let me see if I can tackle them very briefly. On foreign policy, obviously the Congress Party has a very long track record of how we would conduct foreign policy. So you needn't worry that it'll be in safe hands. Uh, U.S. relations is something that we're very proud of having done a great deal to cultivate. Uh, that uh, the Indo-U.S. nuclear deal took place on our watch. And I might say that from both sides, that is both from Washington's perspective and New Delhi's, Indo-US relations have reached a place where you can really genuinely say they're beyond partisan politics. So don't expect any major changes, even of the government changes in India, just as we didn't expect any major change when the government changed in Washington. I think that now they've reached a certain level of stability in Indo-US relations, which will continue. And I might add that um, the Indian-American diaspora is a hugely contributory factor. You're not people whom American political representatives can afford to ignore. Your voices will count in the American process, in the American political system, and you are uh, invaluable to us. And similarly, because you are who you are, you can't be unaware of India anymore in America. And I think for both these reasons, we're going to have a, a good, stable relationship with the US. That was the, the first question. The second was on Shabrimala. I can say that, um, uh, as I've explained in the article you refer to, young man, I was indeed torn because, like most people, I initially welcomed the Supreme Court verdict as a sort of Indian equivalent of Brown versus the Board of Education, that the court was bringing about a change that perhaps the political system might not have been capable of doing, and the judiciary is often a means for change, and I welcomed it as a blow for equality. But then, I saw the reaction of people in my own constituency, particularly women of the very age group that were supposed to benefit from the judgment. And they were extremely agitated. They were out in the streets in spontaneous protests, um, which is why the BAP also changed its mind from their initial welcome of the judgment, because the people felt that their, something really fundamentally sacred to them had been violated. There was a visceral reaction, like being, kicked in the vitals. Um, and I started now making a point of talking for a month after my initial statements. I was silent on the issue because I was talking to people and figuring out what they really felt. And I found overwhelming rejection of framing the issue as an issue of equality. They said, we don't feel unequal in Kerala. We are more than equal as women. But we feel that this is an issue of sanctity and the sanctity of our faith is being violated. Of course, uh, how you frame an issue often helps guide you to a particular answer. So the moment you see this as an issue of sanctity, you realize that indeed the laws of civil equality and discourse that apply in civil situations are often made exceptions of in religious situations. In a Western democracy like America, you could not run a private club with a law that says that no women can be office bearers. But in the Catholic Church, you can have a rule that no women can be priests or bishops. And there's no problem because the church is, in a sense, a law unto itself. And why can't the same principle be applied by the Supreme Court of India to a temple or a mosque, is the question people were asking. That religion is not subject to the same rational principles of civil equality as other things are. And, and I must say that I, I came around to that argument. I was balancing my own political principles and convictions on the one hand with my duty as a political representative to represent the passions and beliefs of my own voters and whose name I claim to speak. So I, I, I adopted the position that you saw me adopt and I've stuck to it. Uh, the difference between my position and the BJP's is that um, the BJP actually was in a position to do something about it. They were in power in Delhi. If they really wanted to solve the problem and ease the pain of the believers, they could have done one of three things. They could have submitted a central government review petition to the Supreme Court. They didn't choose to do that. They could have brought in legislation. They have a majority in parliament and overturned the verdict. They didn't do that. Or they could have got their own hand-picked president to issue an ordinance. They didn't do that. So it became very clear they had no desire to solve the problem. They wanted to keep the problem alive to exploit it politically. And they conducted demonstrations and marshes and obstructed worshippers and converted a sacred shrine into a place of political theater. That I was opposed to. 
But I said it's a constitutional problem, you must solve it constitutionally. And so I have been advocating, including on the floor of parliament, a legislative remedy to place certain religious practices beyond the purview of the courts. At the moment, no one has grasped that nettle. The issue is still very much alive. We'll have to deal with it in the next parliament. Shashmama, I think actually, so, sorry, I know that there were other questions, but we do have to cut it off. Uh, the organizers wanted to make a brief presentation right now. So those of you okay. who have asked well, questions- I'll give one sentence answers to the last two. What was yours? Uh, remind me, young lady. Do you remember? We, we, it, there, there's so many actually also going to be more unanswered questions as well. well one how, sentence. How do intellectuals like yourself and Dr. Singh make more uh, How can we make policies? more of an impact Indian yeah, politics? without being ruled by the party high command. Well, politics is the art of the possible. The high command has a decisive say. Party whips will also limit how much individual freedom of, uh, of, of uh, uh, autonomy can be exercised by any MP or political representative. But if you're a good politician, you work to the desired outcome by persuading people, bringing them along with you. I think Dr. Singh has done that on many occasions, and I hope others will follow in his footsteps. Uh, on the final question about the Bay Area Indians and their sense of responsibility to the underprivileged, I certainly hope so. I believe that one good thing about the Indian American community has been the large number of charities they've been supporting. Um, I mean, I've keynoted galas for a whole lot of charities, Pratham and Asha and others that are active in India. Where they're needed to be active here too, I think they should be. And, and, and certainly in my time here, I was very conscious that Indian Americans are in many ways more socially responsible than the average successful Indian back home in India. They do tend to do more for the community here and back in India. And I urge you all to keep it up, strengthen it. You do have deeper pockets perhaps than most in India. Use it for the benefit of all, and we'll welcome that. Thank you all very much, and sorry Thank we you, ran everybody. out of time. With that, uh, thank you all for coming. I would like to now call on stage Kamil Hassan and Saish Sali, our ICC board member, to give a small token of appreciation to our guests today. I'm sure you all enjoyed the evening. Let's hear it one more time for Sashi Karoo and Ragini.